Hey guys, Miss Marissa here, and in this video, we're going to talk about the formulas when solving integrated rate loss. Uh, in our last video, we looked at differentiated rate loss, which is where we were given concentration and rate data for an experiment in a table. And what we did was we set one trial's rate law expression over another's, and by using algebra, we could end up solving what our orders would be. On integrated rate laws, we're going to be given some different information. We're going to instead be given concentration and time data. And so therefore we're going to have to solve this in a little bit of a different way. We're going to see different formulas being used. Uh, one of the other things that we're going to start to talk about here is the idea also of half-life. Half-life is defined as the time it takes for the initial concentration to fall to half of its initial value. And some of you might be uh, familiar with half-life. We discussed half-life in pre-AP chemistry when we discussed radioactive decay. Um, however, you might have also talked about half-life back in your math class um, if that was something that you calculated and looked at formulas with. There's a few symbols that we want to be familiar with um, in order to understand the formulas that we're about to discuss. Um, so first off, we see here our brackets being used again, which of course tells us concentration from molarity. But we notice here that we have a little subscript of zero, and that represents that we are doing the initial concentration when our time equals zero. If that subscript is replaced with a T, then that would be the concentration at some later time t that we could select what time we wanted to use. Uh, k is again our rate constant, just like it was before. And now we're going to see t or time being used in these equations as well. So to start us off here, we're going to start by looking at zero order. And we notice some familiar things here. Uh, first off, we see rate equals k a to the zero. And of course, if I have a to the zero, I could technically leave that behind and just have that rate equals k. And we also see kind of a throwback to when we talked about relative rates, that this rate expression would also be equal to the negative because it's a reactant, so it's decreasing, change in a over change in time. And so what we can do is say, hey, that time is going to start off as something initially, and over time it's going to change. And so what we want to do is talk about how that changes over that time frame of t0 to some t of a time that we select. So the way we would do that is actually by using integrated formulas in calculus. Now, when I say that, those of you in calculus are like, yeah, integration, I feel like I've heard that before. Those of you that are in algebra two are like, I have no idea what she's talking about. So for those of you in calculus, I do wanna show you a little bit of how this integration works, um, just so that way you can say, oh yeah, I've seen something like that before. Um, so what we have here is the same formulas I wrote just a moment ago. They just eliminated the A to the zero here. And then also, instead of using the delta symbol, they used a D here. And so rearranged, what they did is they said, hey, this change of A, if I left that by itself with the negative, and I bring this delta T over, that would equal this formula right here. And what we want to do is we want to say, hey, time can change from initial to some later time that we select. And so then that's where the integration comes into play. So this is where those steps are that you might kind of sort of be familiar with if you've taken calculus. Don't worry if you have no idea what these steps are showing. Don't stress because you're not going to have to know these. Um, but the end result of that integration, the end result of addressing this formula between a time of zero and some time that we select, is this equation right here, which is what you see written right here, that the concentration of A at some time minus the concentration of A initially would equal a negative our rate law constant K times time. And so what I can do is I can take this formula and rearrange it into a linear equation, a y equals mx plus b format, remembering that m represents our slope. And so when I do that, when I bring over this a to the sub-zero 
over, what happens is that I see k ends up being my slope for this equation. I also see that when I'm dealing with my y and my b, I'm looking at those differences in concentration at those various times. Um, so if I wanted to address what a linear graph would look like for zero order, it would have the concentration of A over here on the y-axis, time on our x-axis, with a slope decreasing down that would be that negative k. By the way, this equation here is on our formula chart, and I'll show you where here in just a little bit. And so what we can do is if we have some concentration data and we have some time data, I can use this equation to end up solving for k. Now, there's one other thing about this equation, and that is with regards to the half-life. If I was to evaluate the time it took for half of this substance to change over into product, or the time it takes for half of A to be used up, I would notice that as my reaction progresses, that half-life time continually shortens. You notice to go from 0.2 to 0.1 here, that took maybe roughly about 35 seconds. But then that second halving to go from that 0.1 to 0.05 took much less time than 35 seconds. And it gets shorter and shorter every time. So the deal is, is that for a zero order reaction, the half-life will decrease as the reaction progresses. All right, next let's look at first order. So for first order, as we're already familiar with, rate equals K, our concentration of A, our reactant raised to an order of one. And sometimes that one is shown and sometimes it's not. Um, so that would be equal to, again, the decrease, because it's a reactant, change in A over change in time. And so, again, I could integrate that formula, addressing that time could go from zero to some other various time of T. And so when I integrate that one, what happens is that, again, I get the delta A, but now I also get it over A itself because that A was involved in the rate law expression here. And so what happens is as I progress through the integration, my ending formula ends up different here. So that integration progresses, it gives us a totally different equation than what we saw with zero order. So here is our integrated formula for first order, the natural log, the ln of a at some time, minus the ln of a at a time of zero, which equals our negative rate law constant k times time. And again, this integrated formula is found on our formula chart for us to use and plug into. So then if I rearrange that formula to put it into a linear format, so again, a y equals mx plus b. Now what I notice here for my y and my b is a natural log, not just a. So a little bit different than what we saw just a minute ago. We also see that that would give us a slope again of negative k. So this time, our linear graph has ln of a and time with our negative slope here. If I was to graph just the regular change in concentration of this and not the natural log concentration, what I would get is those curved graphs that we're used to seeing. But that's not a straight line. The way I pick out a first order is based on what graph gives me a straight line, and that's going to be our natural log graph. Now, when we go back and look at this concentration versus time graph, uh, you'll notice for this one that the half-life ends up remaining consistent. And so what that means is that we could have a formula for that consistent half-life. Now, what this does is it takes this integrated rate law expression and plugs in um, an A concentration initially and then halves that for A over here at some time, and that would end up solving for T. 
Well, because a lot of this ends up being a number and then a number halved every single time, we end up with the consistent equation to use. And so what happens is that for first order reactions, we have this lovely formula here to solve half-life, which is 0.693 over K equals T. The half-life time would be the same throughout the entire process. So this would end up remaining consistent. By the way, again, to re-emphasize here, this only works if my reaction is first order. So then if I have second order, here I would have rate equals K A to the second. And again, I see that decrease in the change in A over the change in time. So what I would do is rearrange this in order to be able to integrate it for the different time frames. And to give you an idea of how that would look, what happens here is that because I have that a squared here, when I rearrange everything, I end up with a different component over here. So as I go through my integration steps, what happens is at the end, I have yet another different formula for my integrated rate law than what we saw with the other ones. Again, you do not need to know these steps, but for those of you that are familiar with calculus, something like this might look familiar to you. So then, what that means is that our integrated formula is 1 over the concentration of A at some time minus 1 over the concentration at a time of 0, which equals a positive KT. Again, this is on our formula chart. If I was to rearrange this into a linear y equals mx plus b format, what I would see is that for y and b, I end up with 1 over concentration. So again, something different on that y-axis. And then I have a slope of a positive k. And so my linear graph would look something like this. I would have 1 over a over here on the y-axis. Again, my x-axis is always time. But this time, the linear linear graph would go up, my slope is a positive k. Now one other thing to notice, this does not trend toward zero because our y-intercept is not zero. So this is what the linear graph looks like. If I was to just graph concentration versus time for something like this, I would again see those curves that I'm used to. But pay attention to this curve and how it was different than the first order curve. Look at my first half lifetime. To go from 20 to 10 took roughly maybe about 50 seconds or so. But then that second half lifetime, which took much longer to go from 10 to 0 0.05 concentration. And then to go from 0 0.05 to 0 0.025 took even longer. So here, my half-life time is increasing. So because on second order and zero orders, those half-lives change over time, a lot of times our calculations will just involve the initial half-life time. We won't have to address half-life times all throughout the reaction because they change. They will just ask us, what is that initial half-life time for the reaction? All right, I wanna show you real quick where these equations are on your formula chart. So if you notice here, there's an entire section on kinetics on your formula chart, and you will see your three integrated formulas. Now here's the key, they're not labeled. Like it doesn't tell you here that this is for zero order, this is for first order, and this is for second order. You have to know that this is for zero, this is for first, and this is for second. Also, we see our half-life formula given here as well. But again, they have no way indicated that this can only be used for first order. So even though those formulas are on here, you still have to be kind of familiar with what you're looking at, or you could get these confused very easily. All right, to see all of this information kind of collected together in a graph, you notice here on this table, I have basically put on here zero first and second order to compare. By the way, you would never see any other orders asked about in these integrated rate laws, so you don't have to worry about seeing like a third order and something like this. All right, so again, our integrated rate law formulas that we see right here are on our formula chart. Okay, um, I have notated which graph has the straight line. Here's why that's important. One of the key things that you would be given when solving these problems is more than likely the three graphs created. You would be shown 
the concentration versus time graph, the natural log of concentration versus time graph, and the one over concentration versus time graph for that particular reaction. And your goal is based on which one gives you the straight line is to determine what our order is. So if I see that out of the three graphs, the concentration versus time graph is the straight line, then I know it's zero order. If I see out of the three graphs that the natural log versus time graph is the straight line, then I know it's first order. If I see out of the three graphs that the one over concentration versus time graph is the straight line, then that means I know I'm second order. That would be the way to tell what order is appropriate. And then I would know which of these integrated rate law equations was appropriate to use to solve the rest of the problem. All right, in our next video, we're going to look at calculating with these formulas. Hopefully, you're feeling okay with just kind of an introduction to this. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.